All right. Welcome to uh, today's training. All right. Welcome to. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, how's everybody doing? Great. How are you doing, Fred? I'm good. I'm good. All right. So, um, Here's what I think we should that we're going to be covering today. So I really wanted today. I really wanted to show um, loops, <clears throat> and I also really wanted to show um, um, storing data on the on your APN account. So uh, caching data on our side and retrieving data. And uh, and so I thought the perfect example for that would be to um, show an integration between two CRMs, um, one that has to have unique emails. So we're going to use HubSpot to do that. So every contact in HubSpot has to have a unique email. And then the other one could have multiple clients with the same email or no email. And HubSpot requires an email through the API. So that's another challenge that I also want to show how we can solve. And we're going to use Clinical for this, which is an app to uh, manage clinics and, and uh, therapists and so forth. Um, so, so the idea is, how do you establish a one-to-one -one connection between Clinical, a patient or a contact, and a HubSpot contact? So they don't overwrite, right? So if you have a many to one, that's a problem because now you start overwriting the same data. So uh, let's get into it. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And what I would love for you guys to do is uh, Mark and Penn, Robert probably not, but just go ahead and ask questions, right? So if, if you see any questions from the attendees, please, uh, Please let me know. But if you have questions yourselves as well, you know, uh, please, please ask them. Okay. All right. So let's share the screen. Okie dokie, let's do it. <clears throat> Actually, we're going to do this on dev because I'm already connected, so much safer. Okay. All right, so let's log in Clinico first so we can show you what we're talking about. So <clears throat> here's Clinico. All right, so you see you have some patients here and then you have some uh, contacts and then we're going to log in uh, HubSpot. And let's do a clinical login here. Okay. All right, and we're gonna build these automations from scratch. So first we're just gonna do patients to contacts. And if we have some extra time, I can also show how we can do um, appointments as well. So clinical to
up spot. All right. All right, so the clinical API is, is, uh, works in a, in a very in interesting way. The way it works is uh, everything is based on, um, on the URL that it returns. So you have to kind of parse the URL <clears throat> to get some information. So, but I'll take it step by step here. So first, we're going to create a, a trigger here for uh, clinical. And I'm going to look for new or updated client. Uh, patient, sorry, new update patient. And I'm going to drink my tea in my apient cup. Mm, tea tastes a lot better in an apient cup. All right. Um, and then what I'm going to do is because in, in clinical, you could have, you could have folks in here, you could have uh, patients they don't even have an email. So let me just uh, create a patient here. Um, and I'll just say, you know, patient first, patient, actually, let's make it more fun. Uh, Gilles, I'm going to use people that I know in my life. Cafiero, okay. Gilles, date of birth. Uh, I don't know his date of birth. Just, I know he's old, so we're gonna go 19, not that old, 1968, okay. Male, um, man, and for the email, we're gonna keep that empty, okay? Because you, you may still want this person in HubSpot, even if that person does not have an email in um in clinical so here he is okay so obviously gilles or giles does not exist here so um and i'm going to call this clinical to spot oh my goodness can't spell today so clinical patient to hubspot contact and before i forget uh, i'm going to put a conditional here real quick and then i'm going to close and reopen it because i do not want to forget um, to connect the correct HubSpot account because I'm connecting so many accounts with this one. So here I'm going to check, uh, does he have an email, right? So here I can just choose email. And if the email is empty, I go to the right. And if the email is not empty, I go to the left. So the true condition is no email. Okay. All right, let's just save that. Oh, at least one action is required. All right, well, I may as well continue here. So what I want to show now is how you can actually store data on the APN account, either temporarily or for long term. Okay. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to save the patient email um, right after that condition. So if he has an email, it's going to go to the left. If he doesn't have an email, it goes to the right. So here I'm going to... Um, use our lookup tables and here i'm going to say save uh, value so here's a save value so now you have a bunch of choices right key group key value name and value it's actually pretty straightforward first thing you need to choose is what is the scope the scope basically means are we saving this value just for this automation are we saving this value for the whole account so you can share the value in between automation. Are you saving the, the value for linked accounts? Linked accounts means 
Do you have multiple accounts linked together on the Apian platform that you want to be able to share values between? Let's say you have a corporate office with franchises. You may want to be able to do that. And then tenant is if you have a tenant system uh, on Apian or if you have a dedicated uh, platform, you can share those values across, across all accounts on that Apian platform, even if they are not linked. Okay. In this particular case, uh, I'm going to say uh, actually this automation because I'm only sharing this value for the runtime of this automation. Okay. I'm going to cr create a key group here called uh, Clinico HubSpot. And while I do that, actually, since Robert's here, Robert, could you kind of explain, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but the, the, the reason for a key group and the key and then the value, how that relates to like a, a database and, and whether would, which one would be the table and which one would be the, the key field and so forth? Sure. <clears throat> um, so basically it's a flexible schema. Uh, this information is going into a single database table. So rather than having to name like the columns, uh, uh, these are just basically the column names. You have a key, key value, uh, the value name. So these are just grouping mechanisms basically so that we don't have to have specific schema to put this information into this database. Nice. And so, so really you, you can see that this would be kind of like your, your table, right? Of all your, your, your rows. And then the key in this case has to be unique. Because when I retrieve it, I want to be able, thank you, Robert, by the way, you want to be able to retrieve the value based on the unique key. So here, the unique key is pretty straightforward. It's going to be the patient ID, right? So here I'm just doing patient underscore ID. It's a really good idea to be very descriptive as to what you're storing, because sometimes you'll store a lot of stuff and you don't remember what's what. So here I'm just saying patient underscore ID and I map the ID of the patient from the trigger. So I just came here and I, I took the patient ID from the trigger. And, and here I'm gonna say the value name in this case is gonna be the email. So here is gonna be the email. Okay. And, and here what I can do is rename this to save uh, patient email. And what I like to do, again, everybody does whatever they want, but what I like to do is to use the same uh, nomenclature that I'm using for uh, patient email in the name of the action so I know exactly what I'm storing, okay? So, uh, good, so that's that. Um, we can also, um, right, now we have to decide what are we gonna do if there is no email? Right, because remember, in order to add this contact to HubSpot, I need an email. So this is what I do. I'm gonna copy this, paste that here. And since we don't have an email, I'm going to construct one that is always gonna be unique for that one uh, patient ID, right? So I'm gonna look for the patient ID and in this case, I would put at symbol and I'll put uh, our domain name. So whoever's building this would put your own domain name. So now you know that that patient is gonna have an email in HubSpot, you're gonna be able to have a one-to-one -one relationship with that, with that patient, okay? Uh, but all you've done is saved it now. You need to retrieve it because you don't know if it's gonna to go to the right or to the left, right? So I need to retrieve whatever is that value at that point. So I'm going to go look up again, get value. And what I like to do is I like to save that. <laughs> and I like to uh, copy field mappings and paste them. It saves me a lot of time. So now when I open it up, it has everything exactly the way I space. It's like copying and pasting. So I don't have to do it. Okay. Um, remember now, you see this is the scope is my account, and then the scope here is this automation. You want to make sure they match, because if you have a scope, this automation for the saving, and a scope that's my account for the retrieving, it's not going to be able to retrieve it. So you always want to make sure that you, you match that. And, you know, this 
I copied and paste from here to here, but I couldn't copy and paste from uh, the actual action because it was a completely different action. So it's it's a common mistake just to make sure you, you, you do that, okay? All right, I'm gonna save that now because I want to, so we're gonna put this in our clinical to HubSpot. I'm gonna keep it off. I do wanna connect the proper um, HubSpot account before I go too far here. So I'm gonna go back to all my apps that are connected here and I'm gonna remove this. <clears throat> all right, uh, let's see, refresh. Okay, and I'm going to connect HubSpot. Well, I didn't spell it, but somehow I knew what I was doing, so. So the pop-up comes on here. You're not seeing that. So let me actually share this with you so you can see exactly what I'm doing here. Okay, so the pop-up comes on. This is on our development platform, so that's why you see it in dev. But here I wanna make sure I use the proper um, the proper one. So I'm gonna use our clinical testing account. And here we go. Okay. All right, so we're back here. So how far did we get? New updated patient, no email, go to the right, then go ahead and construct one with the patient ID and apn.com, has an email, go to the left, okay? Um, now what? Um, you know what I wanna do actually, since this is a clinical demo, we have another endpoint that keeps track of all the appointment totals for that patient. So. I'm going to call that action and it's called get individual appointment totals and all it needs is a patient ID. So I'm gonna get the ID from the patient from the trigger, okay? All right, so now I have just stored the email and in uh, temporarily, and I've retrieved all the patient info here. So what to do next? So next I'm going to uh, check HubSpot. So I'm gonna go to HubSpot and I'm going to find a contact by, instead of by email, right? I'm gonna find a contact by a property. So what does this mean? I go to HubSpot here and I look at all my properties. In my properties for uh, the contact I have, I should, I don't know if this is set up properly, but I should have a clinical, I don't, okay. I don't have one here, but I'm gonna create a group. I'm gonna call it clinical, okay. And then in the clinical group, I'm going to create a property called patient ID. And here, patient ID, okay. This right here is what you wanna use in here. So when it says property name, you wanna use the API property name. So I'm just gonna copy that here Click next, then I'm gonna make it a single text file. Make sure you don't include it in forms. So I have a patient ID here. So here I'm gonna paste patient ID and I'm going to again, map the patient ID from the trigger. Very important here is I'm gonna say continue if non-critical. Who wants to volunteer to tell me, Robert, you're not allowed, but is Mark with us? Yes, no, he's here. 
You want to tell me why I should choose continue if non-critical error? Because you don't want the automation to halt. Uh, it can still continue and still it can still complete its uh, what needs to be done, uh, and you don't want it to to stop it prematurely. Exactly, couldn't have said it better. So, and the reason is because if it creates if it cannot find the contact in HubSpot is going to create a non-critical error. So then you can test against it. And how do we test where we do a conditional, right? So in this con conditional, now I'm going to test, did I find a contact in HubSpot with that patient ID? Because if you, if we make it, if we establish links between patient ID, between patient ID, between clinical and the patient ID, custom property in HubSpot, then we know we'll have a one-to-one -one relationship because patient ID in clinical is a unique property. You cannot have more than one patient with the same patient ID, right? So to do that, I like to use a diagram just because uh, I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna say here, patient ID. Uh, don't see it, that's because, let me see, patient. Clinical. Oh, hold on. Let me do a refresh here. Refresh the field because I created the, the property after I added the action. So I want to refresh the fields in order for it to show. So here we should have it now. Patient, did I save it here? And it's called, what was it called again? It was called the patient ID, yes. So <laughs> I've never had that problem before. I don't know why I'm having it now. Uh, let me just keep that so I don't have to recreate it. Hmm. Okay, refresh. No, I don't have to re-add it. Yeah, okay. Uh, ideally, you create your fields before you build your automation. So I'm gonna come here, HubSpot, find proper, uh, I'm sorry, find, uh, oh, I said, no, <laughs> I know why I don't see it because it's because I'm doing a live demo and you only use 60% of your brain during a live demo. I did find company by property instead of find contact. That's my problem. So that is my problem. Because remember that field is not in the company, it's in the contact property. So that's why we don't see it. All right, find contact by property, patient ID, and we use the patient ID. Oops, it's just ID in this case. This is kind of interesting to talk about actually. So sometimes people will wonder what's what? How do I know which one's paid? How do I know ID is the patient ID? Well, there's no real rule. It's almost like uh, it's French, you know, everything is a rule except the exceptions, which is almost all of it, uh, speaking French. But I will say that if the if the trigger or the action is about a specific object, if the API returns just ID, most likely, and there are exceptions, but most likely, and it is the case here, the ID is the ID of the object that you're pulling, right? So we're pulling here new or updated patient. So this right here, we feel pretty safe that that's the ID of the patient, okay? But be careful. Uh, take your time and may do some tests because sometimes you'll you'll have multiple IDs that come back and they're not necessarily what what you think. So, um, but again, like I said, there are many exceptions to this rule. Okay, so now I'm going to add this find contact property. And what did I forget to do? I forgot to continue. No, I did continue if non critical error. I'm going to remove the company here because I don't need that here. And I'm going to test against this. Uh, 
this one here. So if the fine company here, uh, patient, property patient ID value, right, is not empty, it means we found, um, we found a contact in HubSpot with that patient ID. So what I would do here is find uh, find contact by, and then I'll just put patient ID here, okay? So, and then here, we can explain what you did, found, uh, found, uh, you could do this, patient ID. All right, so recapping, uh, new patient, check if they have an email, they don't create one. Um, here, I'm going to rename this to make sure it's nice and clean. Okay, make sure that this is uh, good here, patient email, okay. Um, and then we get individual appointment totals, and that's going to be all the arrived, all of the no-shows, and all the booked appointments they've had they had since they were a patient then we're going to find the contact in HubSpot by patient ID and then we are going to uh, if we found the contact we can just update the contact and if we haven't uh, then we're going to go to the left so let's assume that we did not find any contact in HubSpot with a value in the patient ID what I would do next is do a different condition here. Um, and it would be, I would add find contact by email. And here I'm going to use um, the email That we have here okay so this will either be and then continue if non-critical this is going to be either the email that is on the patient record in clinico or it's going to be the email we constructed with the patient id at domain.com now why am i doing this it's because depending on how the flow of this particular client is the patient may already exist in, in HubSpot because they responded to some inbound advertising of so forth and somehow they became uh, they became a contact in HubSpot but they've never been linked to Clinico therefore there's no patient ID right so potentially this person with the same email is the same person or potentially this person is not the same person could be a child or a relative of that person so this is where we're starting to get pretty fancy on how we're going to match this stuff. So if we find a contact with an email, first we're, we're going to do a condition to see if we found the contact. So the way to know that is I'm going to come here and say, okay, remember what I said about IDs where for HubSpot it's VIDs. <laughs> so can, a canonical v, uh, VID, okay? So this is the ID of the contact in HubSpot. So here I'm going to say, if the contact is not empty in HubSpot, right, that came back, that means it found a contact in HubSpot with that email, okay? Very important that you just kind of document as you go forward every little step so then you can always go back through your thought process because it's all visual. It's a visual way of documenting your, your integration, so building it and documenting it at the same time which is really cool uh so here i'm going to say found contact okay and i'm going to start with the easy one if it didn't find anyone in hubspot with that email then we may as well add them right so that's the easy one so here i'm going to come here and say hubspot um i'm going to do yeah add contact Okay.
before I forget, the first thing I'm going to map is going to be the patient ID, right? Because then the next time it searches for that patient, it'll go to the right, right? Because we are mapping now the patient ID from the top here. So, so here is the patient ID. And then I'm going to put some basic info. So email for sure. We know, and by the way, if you want to know what's required or not, you can come here and show required field and it'll show you all the fields that are required. Or you can click here and say show only map fields and this will show you all the fields that are mapped. So far we've only mapped one field and there's one required field we haven't mapped, okay? So what is the email? Well, where are we gonna get the email from? Who wants to volunteer? Uh-oh, where am I getting that email from? You uh, are you getting that from the find contact my email? This one? That one? No, I'm I'm adding a contact. Oh. Because I didn't find one. So probably the patient to get the patient email, right? Oh yeah, yeah exactly. Good one. Okay. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> first name <clears throat> and then I'm going to put the last name Mark doesn't mind it when I put him on you know knowing Mark he's probably doing some support stuff right now as I'm speaking so he has probably no idea what I'm talking about Mark's always working okay so first last patient ID email, and you can map anything else. You can map the address. You could map, I mean, we could even go further with this. We can map who referred them. We could connect uh, uh, their referral uh, to them as a deal. I mean, there's a lot we can do, but right now I'm just going to keep it simple just to deal with this one-to-one -one kind of challenge that we have or many-to-one challenge, okay? So I add the patient here, add the contact. If I found the email, right? then i need to make a decision okay so there is another person with that email right that doesn't have that patient id right so that's all we know right now if i go at this point when i'm here the only thing i know is one i could not find a contact with that patient id in hubspot right two there is another person with that email in hubspot so what do i need to find out now I need to find out, find contact with, uh, by email, right? Um, I need to find out if that other person that I found with, or that person that I found with an email, if that person has a patient ID. Because if, it, if they have a patient ID already in HubSpot, it means it's not the same person because there's already a person with that patient ID, right? So that's what I need to find out next. So. Here, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to say uh, conditional, right? And I'm going to say, all right, this person here that I was just looking for, which is this person here, right? Their clinical ID, right? Their, I'm sorry, their patient ID, is it empty or not? So I'm going to say is not empty. So it's not empty, it's gonna to go to the right. And if it's empty, it's gonna to go to the left, okay? So here I'm gonna say rename uh, contact found has a patient, oops, ID. Is that what we call that? Patient ID, right? Or what did we call it? I forgot what we called it. Patient ID, right. So, all right, contact has a patient ID. We know it's not the same contact. If, if, you're, if we are here now, we know this person has the same email, but it's a duplicate from, from Clinico because they don't have the same patient ID that we got from the trigger, right? So we'll decide what we're gonna do next here. But if they don't have a patient ID in their record, then we can make an assumption we don't know for sure, but at, that, at some point you have to make a decision. We can make an, an assumption now 
that uh, we're going to actually link them to the clinical account, okay? So to do this now, I'm gonna say update instead of add. I'm gonna say update HubSpot. Update contact. And I'm going to use the ID that we found right above, this ID here, right? Remember, it's canonical, canonical uh, VID. Okay, so, and then the next thing I'm gonna do is now I'm going to add the patient ID in there, right? That I get from the trigger. And I can update the, uh, I don't have to update the email technically because it already has it. That's how we found them, so we don't have to do that. But the first name might have changed. So here I'm going to say first name. Last name. Okay. And obviously anything else that you might want. Address, email, Twitter account, or whatever. Okay. All right. So going back here. And I do that often. I go back to the top and I just kind of re-narrate my, my decisions here. Find contact by patient ID. No, could not find anybody in HubSpot with that patient ID. Good. Find contact by email. No, could not find anybody in HubSpot with that email. Therefore, let's add that contact in HubSpot using the patient information that we got from the trigger. If it's a yes, means we found a contact in HubSpot. Then we need to check, does that contact that we found, right, do they have a patient ID in the record? And if they do, we know it's not the same. It's not the same as the one we got because it said no up here, right? But if they don't have a patient ID, then we can actually link that contact to the patient by, click, by doing update contact. So then the next question is, what do we do if we now are faced with a duplicate patient, duplicate email in Clinico, and knowing that we cannot have du duplicate emails in HubSpot. Well, this is what we do. Well, this, this is what I chose to do. You could do whatever you want, but this is what um, this is what I do. I'm going to transform data, and I'm going to choose here the first one here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate a JavaScript expression, okay? So uh, right here. And here you can put in any kind of JavaScript that you want, okay? And so what I want to do um, is I want to take the email, split it apart, put a plus, and then put the patient ID before the at symbol. So it'll have, so let me show you here. And let me share my screen differently. Let me pull up a little uh, text. All right. All right. This is what I want to do. I'm just going to kind of uh, show you a demo of, of what I want to happen here. So if the email is more, um, if the email is support at apient.com. All right. You can all read this. <laughs> okay. So if the email is support at apient.com, right? And I know that uh, I cannot use supportapin.com because it's already taken in HubSpot. There's a duplicate in, in, in clinical, but not in HubSpot. What I want to do is I want it to be support plus, and then here I'll just put in brackets here, patient ID at apin.com. So no matter who the person is, the email is going to be their first part of the email, a plus, then we're gonna put the patient ID and an at, and then we're gonna use their domain. 
the reason we do this is because if I send an email to support plus, uh, plus uh, one, two, three, four at apn.com, because we're using um, Google G Suite, which is Gmail, that email will actually go to support at apn.com. So it's a nice little trick. You can put whatever you want in front, uh, 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 in front of the at symbol, and it will still go to that email. Now, it, it won't work every time with every domain or every email provider, but it'll work with a lot, and it'll work with Gmail, which is pretty big. So, so if the person's name is Linda at domain.com and her daughter has this and her daughter has this patient ID if HubSpot sends an email to that email Linda will get it okay so that's why we do this okay and it really allows us to to have a, a many to one relationship so let me go back to my screen here and I'm going to show you the JavaScript that does that so I'm just going to paste it in here and then we're going to take a look at it so uh, this is the email so I'm going to put the email in between here so this is the email um, right here And then this is the patient ID from the patient ID here. All right. So if we look at this JavaScript, you can actually click uh, this little uh, uh, pen here to have a bigger view. And it has a, an actual code editor, which you can choose your syntax and all kinds of stuff. And you can wrap your lines if you have a lot of stuff. The only thing is that the map field will be represented by this uh, UUID here. So, so what I recommend is map them first, right? And then if you want to edit your JavaScript, you can do it here so you can have a, a better view. But basically, it's pretty straightforward. What it does is it stores the email, the patient ID. It figures out where the position of the at symbol is, okay? And then it reconstructs the email by putting a plus with the patient ID before the atom or exactly like I showed you, okay? So that's what this does. And if you want an example of this, just let us know or ask, you know, uh, chat with us and say, hey, could I have a copy of that JavaScript for constructing emails? It's pretty cool and I really want it. So, but what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to rename this add plus patient ID before in email. Okay. And then, then what do I do? So at this point, uh, I need to create a brand new person, right? So here I can just copy this, which is add a contact. I can paste this here and I can make sure that the email is not mapped to this, but the email is mapped from the output of this JavaScript here. Okay. And, uh, and then I do the rest. First name, last name, and then the patient ID. So everything else is the same. Does this make sense? Sure does. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's give it a little test. Uh, then if we have more time, we, we do have more time. I'll, we'll see if I can go a little further here, but um, yeah, so let's do, give it a little test. I'm gonna say done. And remember that every time you save a version, it'll ask you to give it a little description and then you can retrieve your versions right here. So right now I did the initial version and then done. Okay. So let's see what happens when I run it.
nothing because this is the first time I run it, right? Now I'm going to make a change to uh, Gilles just to trigger a change. Gilles was one of my best friends when I was in high school. So, and I know he's on Facebook and we started streaming on Facebook. So maybe he's watching. Um, extra information. Oh, Gilles now is a uh, vegetarian, veg vegetarian chef. He changed his career. He used to be, let me spell vegetarian. He used to be a, um, he used to be in um, um, technology like me, and then he became a vegetarian chef. I don't know why I'm sharing this with you guys. I'm sure you don't care. But anyway, <laughs> let's run this again. All right. All right. So it executed. Before we look up Gilly in HubSpot, let's see what happened here. All right. So. There was a change to his account in uh, Clinico. Okay. All right. So he came down here and it says, is there an email or not? Right. And here you can see when you move your mouse on top of each one of these actions, it shows you the input and output. So on the left of the condition, it was empty, right? And the condition is empty was true. So he moved to the right and it created an email for him, or at least a stored an email from him. And it put his, his patient ID at AP.com. Okay. And then moving down here, get the patient email. It, we retrieve what we just stored. Okay. So this is the pa is the patient ID different? No, the same. Okay. Then we got his visits totals. So he had no books. I just created him. So he has no information here. And then we looked him up in HubSpot and say find contact by patient ID, right? That patient ID in that custom property could not be found. So it went to the left, right? And then if we find the contact by email, we could not find a contact by email. It says object not found, right? So it went to the left and then it created him in, in HubSpot. So now if I go to HubSpot and I look, for my contacts here he is up here okay uh let's let's try to do a couple scenarios where we go different different branches right so uh we want to do one where there is an email okay uh and see what happens so let's just find somebody with an email so i'll just put angela all right, test client 50 at apn.com. All right, let's hit test here. All right, so this one. She had an email, so I went to the left here. It saved her email, which is testclient50.ap.com. And then it came down here and it says, can I find a client with that patient ID, right? No, I cannot. Okay, so then can I find a, cl a contact with uh, that email? No, and so it added Angela here, okay? Test50.ap.com, so here she is. Here's Angela. Okay, let's see if we can get it to go through another uh, route. So uh, we did forget something. It's that if we found the patient, we're doing nothing here. We should really update the patient with a new info. So let's make a change here. Fred, when you have a minute, we've got a question. Yep. All right, Ken Showalter wants to know, would you normalize data prior to running so you would have the issues? He might have meant so you would not have the issues, but I'll let you decide. I would, <laughs> I absolutely would. But um, unfortunately, you know, often uh, what happens is you're working with systems and clients that come to us that already have 
uh, issues where, with their data. So that's one thing. The, the, second, the, the second part of my answer is that sometimes you don't have that choice. So let me explain. The fact that you can have more than one client with the same email in clinical is by design, right? Uh, because, you know, this may be a, a therapist, uh, um, a clinic that does therapy for children. And, and the parent wants to register each patient individually, obviously, but each with their own email, but the email all being her email, right? The, the, the mom. So you may have three or four children that all have the same email. So it's by design. And by design, it's incompatible with HubSpot. Therefore, we have to put these kinds of logics to have that one-to-one -one relationship. But if the reason you have bad emails or, 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 um, or inconsistent data, um, then I would fix it ahead of time. Now, I just realized that maybe I answered a different question that he didn't ask. Were you asking, should we normalize the data before we do the check up here? Is that, do you want to clarify um, what your question was? Because now I'm wondering if you were asking, should we normalize the data before we update it? So I, I don't know. He responded, said, thank you. Um, oh, no, no, he just responded again, said before writing. Right, right, before writing. Well, that's kind of what we're doing, right? Because you don't know so all of this right here is really logic that helps you make that decision right you don't know if you have to do this here before you find out if hubspot already has any, uh, another contact with that email so in a way we are because we are normalizing the data here before we go here so perfect he said he's good thank you okay. ken yeah yeah thank you pen um Right, so one thing that we were missing here is we were not updating if the contact was found. So let's do that very easy here. All I have to do is grab this, copy, and then I'm going to paste that here. And then I'm going to connect. So remember when I copied and paste, right? This is not linked to this. This is linked to, as far as the ID, is still linked to wherever I copied it from. And if you wanna know where it's linked to, just in case, you can actually come here and click that little I and double click on it. It will show you where that field was linked from. So this will never get data from here, right? It can't, it can't go, but it can't do that. So uh, you wanna make sure that it's linked to the proper, to the proper action. In this case, it's this one here. And then everything else is mapped from the trigger. So we're good to go because the trigger is always on the very top of the tree. So we're good to go here. So I'm going to save that. Added update if found contact by patient ID. All right. Um, I wanted to do a case where we go, I just want to test if you, if you can afford the time, <laughs> I like to test every branch. <laughs> uh, it's not always possible, especially when you have super complicated, uh, automations that we build. Um, but, but it's good to do that. So what I want to do next is I want to test it where it finds, uh, I think I've already done this one, right? Uh, no, I haven't done it. So let's do it where it finds the email, the patient, if it finds the contact in HubSpot, but it doesn't have a patient ID, okay? This is the use case where somebody may have come uh, and ended up in HubSpot and completely unrelated to, to Clinico. So let's do that. So I'm gonna go uh, find a patient here. So let's do Barry. All right. Oh, this is an actual person. I want to change that. I don't know where that comes from. We don't want to send Barry an email. So where is the email in Clinico? Right here. Barry Keel at apin.com. Oh, but if I 
say yeah so i'm gonna do that but before i save just to make sure that it doesn't trigger before i'm ready for my test i'm gonna create in here too k e i l i don't know why i added an h all right so barry keel at apin.com I think Barry Keel may be one of the founders of Clinico. So when you start a, a development environment, I think they just created, I don't know, I'm not sure. All right, so I'm gonna create this person here. So Barry's here and remember that this, this person, Barry, and by the way, I'm gonna bring uh, that Clinico ID here in the view so we can see it. So our oh, patient ID. So I just do this and I'm gonna move that to the top right now so we can see it every time. All right, so patient ID is empty, right? So we do want to make a match with this one because he's the only person in HubSpot that has that email and we want the match to happen. So let's save that. Let's run this automation again. Okay, let's take a look at it. There's something very satisfying in building complex automations visually. This is not complex, but when they are. And to do a test with the expectation of going exactly down the puzzle or down the maze. And when you do the test that it does exactly that. There's something very satisfying about this. Uh, and it did exactly that. So Barry came down here, there was no patient ID um it could find the contact in hubspot with that email right so it found an email but now uh it checked does that person have a patient id and the answer was no therefore it updated barry with the contact id uh, with the patient id so if i do a refresh on barry now i should have a patient id right here because it made a match so here it is, patient ID. Now let's let's do the next thing, right? So what we want to do is we want to say, let's say Barry has a son. Okay, so we want a second person in Hub in Clinico with that same email. What we're gonna to want to do is we're gonna to want to go to this branch because it's gonna say, I'm not gonna override it because it's a second person in Clinico with the same email. Therefore, I'm gonna create a brand new person with a new patient. So let's do that. So I'm gonna use the same email as Barry. And I'm gonna call this one Mark Keel. Okay. And in the email, I'm going to put the same email. So now this is Barry's son. And um, actually here, I think you can add a relationship. And the relationship is Barry Keel is Mark's parent. So to your question, normalizing in this case, you can't do that. It, it, it is designed to work this way. Okay. Um, so I'm going to save that. So we have Mark Keel with Barry's email. Let's see what happens. There you go. Mark was updated could not find mark in hubspot find the contact by email yes found the contact but the contact already has a patient id so we're going to choose to make it a new contact but before we do that we're going to create a custom email which is barry keel plus the patient id at apn.com 
and then we're going to add this contact. So now in HubSpot, we'll see a second entry for Mark Keel. That's it. Um, okay, makes sense. So you can get a lot more fancy with this as far as the rules and so forth. I mean, it, it all depends on what the business rules are. Um, you can compare first and the last name, you can compare addresses. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. The good news is the Apian platform really allows you to build all of this logic. Um, so, so you can make some good decisions. So, so the system or so the automation can, can make some good decisions as you move forward. Um, okay, I'm going to take a little pause here and, and take some questions. Uh, Penn, do you have any any other questions? Or do you, anybody ask any questions? Or do you have any questions? No questions have come through, but I do have a question. Um, as someone who maybe has never done this before, how can you plan um, while when going into this so that you make sure you don't miss any steps? Is there something that you can do prior to starting? That's such a good question. Um, so I've done, I've been building automations um, with APN for six years now. And, and I come from a, um, you know, um, I used to be a CTO many years ago. So I come from a, you know, spec requirements background and so forth. And when I got started, I used to draw everything out and write everything out, write all my rules you know, in a document so I could think through everything on paper first. And to some extent, if that works for you, you can do that, right? Write out all your rules. I used to do this because I used to think I really need to document what I'm going to do as well. So if I ever want to make changes, I can go back to it. But I'll tell you that I stopped doing that uh, many years ago. And, um, and I'll tell you when I stopped doing that. I stopped doing that when we introduced the new uh, history, uh, execution history um, uh, interface, which is this, which is it shows you exactly what's happening to the data as you move forward. And I found that it was such a really cool way to experiment because like, like you said, like you saw in the last hour, I built this and, and I did test and I got you know, data to move in every branch. I found it so much better rather than having to think through it all without having any visual. So my answer to you is if you have a sandbox accounts, right? So this is a sandbox account, meaning this is not real data. And this is not real data, right? This is not a real HubSpot account. This is not a real clinical account. And you have no fear of ruining data because you can experiment as, as much as you want. I would say, give it a shot, build it a little bit like Legos, right? You, you start, you don't really know what it's gonna look like at the end. You know where you're going with it. You're building a castle, but you're not sure the right wall is gonna be red or not, right? I would say go ahead and give this a shot because it's a really good way to force you to think through oh I hadn't thought of that because you'll discover that that there are things you hadn't thought of because maybe the API is responding in different ways or you may maybe you hadn't thought that people could have the same email or maybe they could all have you know bad emails for instance like i haven't even shown you what happens if the email is bad somebody said you know barry at apian.con that's actually more common than you think a lot of people f don't put the m they put an n and i think the problem is that the m and the n are so close on the keyboard that's an invalid email so are you really going to think through that through a spec doc so look i'm not I'm, I'm not against people you know drawing out all their specs before they build stuff but this tool really allows you to do it visually and experiment and, and construct it as you go, so to speak. Does it make awesome. sense? Yeah, that's great. And then a little plug for Apient here. Um, if someone did need help, we offer professional services. Can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and what, sure. what sure, we can sure. help? Yes. So 
So you can build this yourself. You can go as far as you want to go. Uh, the most valuable tool you're going to have probably is going to be <laughs> this version history thing because you can't you you can't screw up too much, right? You can always go back in time. If I get if I went back to the part where I had my initial version here, this is what it looked like, and I could save that. Okay, so every time you save a version, you can go back in time. If you're really stuck and you need our help, you can actually hire our professional services to help you. Um, incredibly affordable. I'm actually going super slow now because um, I, I really want to make this more of a training uh, rather than just a demo. Um, but we built stuff very, very fast, just mainly because the tool really allows us to build stuff very, very fast. Uh, let me just show you here um, this. I'm actually using this as a sample. Oh, and before, and so you, you can hire professional services. We charge $100 an hour, um, and you can use as many hours as you want. You may need just one hour just to help you out, or you may want us to do your whole project, and then we'll estimate how many hours it takes, and you can just buy credits ahead of time. But just to, to show you here, this is actually inspired by an automation that I built um, actually recently this week. Uh, but when it's fully finished, this is what it looks like. This one automation. And it's clinical and HubSpot, by the way. And you'll see, so this is what we built together, right? So, I, and I'll zoom it out a little bit. Okay, this is what we built together. And this is what inspired me to build this because I built that this week. And you can see how much more there is to it. Or oh, actually, I need to open these groups. There you go. There was a lot more to it. And I'll describe a little bit what it does. But, you know, it's like anything. Everything is building blocks, right? So you've got to put a foundation before you start putting up some walls. So this would be kind of like your foundation. And then you just say, okay, let me continue with it. So let me just describe to you what we did next. So everything here, we did exactly the same. Okay, you recognize this. But, uh, oh, here I converted uh, birth date to HubSpot date. Okay, so I, I, we can do that next if you want. But here, we did the same thing with the contact. And then we went a little further here. And now we look for the referee, uh, the referee, sorry, the per uh, and, and the referrer, who referred the patient, right? And this is right here the patient refer, you can see it down here. So there's a reference contact, another contact referred the patient or a doctor referral, right? So this is what this does. It continues and it looks for the, uh, the patient referral. It does the same thing with this. It makes sure that the contact in HubSpot is not duplicated. If it is, it'll create a unique contact. And then it brings it all together it brings the contact and the referrer together by adding them as a deal. Now, I've done another version with this with Clinico where we actually um, add them to a company, right? So you can, you can do whatever you want. You may want to say a referrer is a company because it's a doctor's office and then all the clients are part of that company. Or you can have, you know, the referrer uh, has a deal and each deal is the person they've referred. So, um, so you can go a, a lot further with this. Um, let me show you, cause this is actually kind of cool. Let me show you, uh, the, this piece right here, which is, uh, the birth date. Okay. So anybody who uses HubSpot will probably love this because dates in HubSpot can be pretty mysterious. Um, so. Let's say we want to update the birth date in an actual date format. Okay. So first, where are we going to put it? Right. Um, we're going to put this in a field called birthday. So I'm going to come here and it has to be a date so you can calculate it against it. So I'm going to go back to properties, contact properties and look at birth date. And there is a date of birth here. But this is one that comes from uh, leads ads from uh, Facebook. 
and it's a single line text. It's not an actual date, so you can't calculate it against it. So I don't recommend people use that to keep track of birthday, especially if it's patients and you want to say, hey, happy birthday or whatever. So create one. And then here we're going to say contact information is the group. And here we're going to call it birth day. And here I'm going to say clinical birthday. Okay. Here I'm going to choose a, um, a date format, a date picker, which is a HubSpot's date format. So now I have a date of birth. I'm sorry, a birthday, date picker. You notice the difference here. This is single line text. This is a date picker here. All right, so um, let's add a <clears throat> an action here. Right below the get individual appointment totals, and we're going to choose a transform data. And I'm going to say transform date and time. So <clears throat> modify and reformat date and time. Our modify date and time action is incredibly, incredibly powerful. You can do so much with it. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I can't even tell you how much you can do with it. You can do a lot. You can reformat dates, you can convert dates, you can do a ton, a ton of stuff. So the first thing you wanna ask yourself is, what date format output do I need? So for uh, HubSpot, HubSpot uses, um, uh, GMT date formats. So they use uh, the Unix dates. So in here, I'm going to put epoch, I'm going to type epoch milliseconds midnight. If you create a field in HubSpot in the UI, like I just did here, and you choose date picker, the output always has to be epoch underscore milliseconds midnight if you don't know what epoch is look it up it's basically a unique uh, serial number since 1970 robert it started in 1970 for number one uh, the first um, uh, yeah i don't remember the date either but it's like around 1970 right it's the uh unit i think it's when unix was created wasn't it um so it starts at uh one and then it moves forward in the future and it goes backward for the past with a minus okay but this is what hubspot's going to use if you create a date field in hubspot where you want to keep track of the time as well okay it's a different field it's a different format it's called date time it keeps track of the day and the time you can only do that through api also very valuable if you ever want to calculate against a specific time in a day uh, then you wouldn't need the midnight. The reason you want midnight is because you want to stay within that day and, and it's just a day. So, uh, and then also the value that we're going to use as a source um, um, in this case is going to be the uh, date of birth. So I'm going to come here, date of birth. I'll just go through this a little bit because there's so much you can do. You can put some modifiers here, uh, depending on what the what you're converting, right? You can put uh, in regular text plus three hours or plus two days or or whatever else you want. You can do some time zone offsets. So if the APN account is in a certain time zone, um, and I'm not going to cover all that here, but you can actually adjust time zone uh, information based on UTC and so forth. So th there's a lot to it. Takes a while to get used to to how, or it'll take a while to figure out exactly what to put in there based on what you're trying to do. But we can convert just about anything from to, okay? So in this case, we just need to take this date of birth and then we need to convert it to the HubSpot format. So here, I'm gonna rename this to modify clinical date of birth or convert actually to HubSpot date, okay? And then I'm going to map the output of that to every time I create or update a HubSpot contact. So I'm gonna to go to contact here, 
I'm going to look for that field and I'm not going to find it, but I want to do that on purpose because I want to show you what you do, right? So here I'm going to do birth. I'm only going to have one. That's not the one we want. Remember, that's the one that's from Facebook, right? That's not a date format. So I'm going to do a refresh field here because I created that after. Now I'm going to do a search for birth. Now you can see it, birthday. That's the clinical birthday we created. And see that clinical birthday, that field here? That's the, that's the field type. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, description, clinical birthday. So that description here is what shows up here, okay? So here I'm going to map the output of that. And then instead of having to click and drag and or, or point to go find it again, you can actually copy this, um, this mapping. So I selected it and copied it. And then you can paste it everywhere. You're going to want to do a date. So refresh field to go find it. Birthday, paste. Refresh. Birthday, paste. And then refresh. Birthday. Paste. So one could ask, why did you have to open each one? And why didn't you just use copy field mappings and paste field mappings? Because they would overwrite field mappings. And remember how each one was slightly customized to use an ID from a different source or or an email from a different source. If I just copied all the field mappings and pasted them here and here and here, I would have lost my customizations for each one of those, okay? So that's why I didn't do that. I typically do that the first time I create it. At least I get rid of the bulk and then I deal with the exception um, for each field mapping. All right, so let's do a test with a date of birth. Added DAB uh, conversion and mapping. Again, manage versions. You can see that's the one I just did, right? All right, so let's go back to, to tell you what, why don't we dump them all into HubSpot? So the first time you run this here, you can do an export mode if you have that kind of account and that exports everything that it's allowed to fetch. That's going to take a while. I didn't know we had 100. I thought we had only a couple. All right. So let me just cancel that. I thought we only had the ones I saw. I didn't realize that there were some 18 pages. Okay. So forget about that. I'm going to just do Gilles. All right. June 2nd is his birthday. Let's expose the birthday field so we can see it right away. So let's go back to contacts here. View properties. Birth date, add to view, bring it to the top so it's easy to look at right now. Oh, you're, I guess he just updated. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do someone else. So I'll just look at a patient here. Go to page. These are all test accounts. Okay, that's why. All right, let's pick this one. Edit. Jane. Uh, Smith, date of birth, 12, March, 1989. What's her email? Okay, that's fine. Okay. 
execute. And here she goes. So let's see what happened to her. So come down here, could not find her before. So just added her. I'm going to change her date of birth just to make sure that Let's find her here. Okay, so here she goes. Her birth date is March 12th, 1989. Okay, let's change it. Because I do want to, so let's say I'm not born in 1989. I'm born in 1995. I do want to do the branch where it just updates. So, all right, run that again. go all right so that's the branch we hadn't actually tested so came down here said yep i could find jane with that patient id right and i updated her birthday so her birthday is now this epoch second uh, epoch milliseconds midnight that's what this is if i actually take this and if you go convert epoch milliseconds you go to any epoch converter and you put that in there and you'll see that it's march in my time march 11th 1995 but it's in it's march 12th 1995 uh, at midnight which is uh so good march 12th 1995 at midnight and here this is going to change when i do a refresh 1995 March 12th all right um if there's any no other questions we're probably going to end here Penn do you is there any anything else that, are, that is no, coming nothing up else. okay so I'll just end with that I think what we're going to try to cover next so this was pretty simple stuff with uh just one uh store and retrieve uh, what I'd like to cover next is, you know, how you can store and retrieve across automations. And also maybe next time, next week, we'll do some looping so we can loop through arrays of data. And then what I really want to show is, you know, arrays of data that are not necessarily consistent, right? You may have uh, an action or a trigger that has five fields, all with arrays, one with five record and the other one with 10. How do you decide which field to pick in order to loop through so you don't jumble up the data. So that's why we're going to cover next. And I'll try to find a really good example for that. But that's it for today. And I appreciate everybody's time. Have a wonderful weekend. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Brad. Bye. You're welcome.